You think I'm ever gonna get used to this? Sorry. Welcome to Foundational Bible Teachings. God is not mocked. You think you're gonna take him for a ride? You're messing with the wrong guy. He's gonna take you for a ride, and believe me, your two little shoes, they're gonna pop up, they're just gonna pop off your feet. So this is official. I'd like to welcome everybody to tonight's Bible study. We're gonna be continuing our series on urgent message, rapture, millions will soon disappear. Tonight's gonna be episode 17. Before we get started, let's pray. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, noten veshomer ekvarech, lelamed leadrichut leanhot otanu, bederech sheba alenu lalechet, alei dat perhat anenu, ozanenu vilevno. Lemaan timsor lanu, merachmatech ed yatra udvunatech, venireth nifleot mi toratra. Sheroa hakodesh, shalacha tanhet kolanu el kola emet, merechet limud hamilash elecha beshem Yeshua. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, giver and preserver of your word. Teach, instruct, and guide us in the way we should go by opening our eyes, our ears, and our hearts, that you may impart to us of your wisdom, your knowledge, and your understanding, that we may behold wondrous things out of your law. May your Holy Spirit guide us into all truth. Bless the study of your word in Yeshua's name. Amen. God hates pride, period. We saw last week Proverbs 8, 13 that says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy, and the evil way in the forward mouth do I hate. There's something that I didn't say last week. The fear of the Lord. When people hear the word fear, the fear of the Lord, they think that you gotta be shaking in your boots and be scared of God. Or like Elvis once sang, you're all shook up. It has nothing to do with that. The fear of the Lord here is different. The fear of the Lord, it's the ninth definition, which means reverence, respect, and due regard. The reverence or the respect of the Lord is to hate evil pride and arrogancy, the evil way the forward mouth do I hate. If you respect the Lord, you're going to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy. If I respect you, and there are certain things that you don't like, for me to respect you, because I value the relationship that we have, I will make sure that that will be erased from our relationship. What you need to understand is that when you come to the Lord for salvation, it is a relationship that you're starting between you and your God. The two words that got me when I was living in Fiji back in 1984 is found in Daniel chapter 6. And as I was reading halfway through the chapter there, at one point it says that Daniel prayed to his God. When I read his God, I got jealous. And I remember looking up and I go, could you be my God? I'm 22 years old. Those two words to me was the beginning of something that started to pivot. Just those two words, all of a sudden now, I just shifted a couple of degrees. A couple of degrees right here today, it doesn't mean anything. But if I keep walking, even one degree, half a degree, what happens after three, four kilometers? All of a sudden now, there's space. What happens after 15, 20, 30 kilometers? All of a sudden, there's more space. Just because of that half a degree of a change, you're reading something in the scriptures. These words, they just grab you on the inside and you follow its precept. You follow what those words are telling you. God is going to lead you in the right path. God will never lead you down a path that's going to be bad. If God allows something to happen in your life, it's because He's teaching you something. If something bad is happening in your life, God might be chastising you because of something that you've done that you weren't supposed to do. But when you keep your nose in a book, you're keeping clean. And that's what happened to me. His God. That's what happened to me. I says, I want a relationship with you. These words came out much later. And what happened is that when I confessed the Lord Jesus Christ, believing in my heart that God raised him from the dead, confessing with my mouth, believing in Jesus Christ, he gave me the gift of salvation. I was sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. What happens? There's a relationship that starts in whatever type of relationship, mother, father, children, boyfriend, girlfriend, husbands, wives, friends, colleagues at work, whatever it is. If you have a certain respect, a due reverence for these people, an esteem for these people, and you know there's certain things they don't like, to preserve this relationship, you're gonna keep that filth out of there. When I came to the Lord, I couldn't explain it. I used to curse, every second word was a clean word. Everything else was dirty coming out of my mouth. That was one of the dirty things that I had with me. That was one of the first things that I dropped like a hot potato, thank you Lord. And then as I kept on walking day by day, reading the word, words were coming in and slowly, slowly, it was washing me from the inside out. And all of a sudden now I'm becoming better and better. And because I value the relationship that I have between me and my God, I try to walk with him to the best of my abilities, as present as I can in all consciousness that I can. Go back to the verse now. 
The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. If you have reverence, if you have respect, due regard for God, you're going to hate evil. What is evil? I covered a lot of it last week. What about pride? Let's say I'm a prideful person or I'm an arrogant person. Or let's say I walk in an evil way or I have a forward mouth. God says, I hate that. So because I have a relationship and I value that relationship, I'm staying away from all of that stuff because I value this relationship. And man, believe me, do I value this relationship. Very quick story. My son is about two, two and a half years old. He's allergic to eggs. We don't know. In Italian culture, we have a soup that we call la stracciadella. You crack in a couple of eggs, maybe 30 seconds, and then you pull it out. We didn't know that he was allergic to eggs. He ended up having two and a half bowls of the stuff. Yes, my son was a pig. Yes, I understand. All of a sudden, his throat started closing. And as he was breathing, it sounded like this. <sighs> All of a sudden, my wife goes, what's wrong, what's wrong? Oh no, I think he's allergic to the eggs. So right away, I went and called 911. My wife is freaking out. And lady goes, what is it? I go, I think my son is allergic to eggs. He goes, don't hang up the phone. What's the screaming in the background? My wife, send her to the room. Thank God she used to listen to me. I go, Sam, please go to the other room. Right away, she took off. And she was explaining to me, if the baby sees something exciting, his heart's gonna start beating, he's gonna wanna breathe, but because it's closing up, he's gonna pass out. He goes, put him down, talk to him softly, and take all of his shirt off. And I says, okay, thank you, and I was about to hang up. No, 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 you stay on the phone. Can I put the phone down? As long as you don't hang up. Watch what happens, I put the phone down. As I'm looking at him, and it was going, <laughs> at one point he started whistling. When you whistle, it's so small, that's the actual hole that he had breathing. And this was my prayer. Lord, this is my firstborn. I would like to keep him. And I went, at that point, like it says in 1 Peter 5, 7, casting your care upon him because he cares for you. And I said, Lord, I would like to keep him. And then I went, whatever you decide, I'm going to be fine by it. It's at that point that I released whatever happened, that he lived, that he died, I would have been okay. And I'm looking at him and it's getting worse. And I'm thinking, let me look at him. Now that he's got these last few breaths in his mouth. All of a sudden, he went, he, he was whistling. I looked, I'm getting goosebumps. I looked up and I, yeah, I looked up and I said, thank you, Lord. Thank you. As soon as this happened, doorbell rings. I go, it's the doorbell. They were tripping all over their stuff. They finally came in. They do whatever they had to do. And I hung up and we ended up going to the hospital. I was about to tell them, guys, go home because my son's fine. But we ended up going, ended up finding out that he was allergic to the eggs. What does this story have to do with what I was saying? That's why I value my relationship with the Lord, my God. Those two words that I read back in, uh, in Daniel chapter 6, my God. I says, I want you to become my God. There's a relationship between me and him. Do you know how many thousands and tens of thousands of prayers that I've prayed in 38 years? There were times where I'd be on my knees for at least two, three hours praying. Half an hour, three hours, an hour and a half, whatever it was. I've prayed for many hours on end. I wouldn't be able to get up because then I would pray on my knees. That's the relationship that I want. Go back now to Proverbs chapter 8, 13. The fear of the Lord, the reverence that I have for God, the due regard, the respect that I have before me and my God. He says to hate evil, I'm going to hate evil. What about if I'm prideful? Lord, please help me break this pride. Go gently, please, because if he gets you, he's going to dang you across the head. And arrogancy. I still have some of this problem. I need to control myself. When I notice that it's coming up in my head, down boy, relax. And I got it bad many years ago. Proverbs 16.5, everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand joined in hand, he shall not be unpunished. Nebuchadnezzar was full of pride. Pride, when accomplished, is an ugly sin. Pride comes in different shades and degrees. They're all bad. Whatever gives you the attitude of being better than the other guy, I humbly say to you, try to eradicate that from you. Because when God is going to come down to abase you, you don't want to be on the other side of the hand. Trust me on that one. And by the way, there's nothing wrong having a certain proud look, a proud way, and taking care of yourself, your looks, your clothes, whatever it is. There's a healthy sense of pride, but there's a disgusting look of pride. I can be proud of my achievements. I can be proud of my kids at school, my wife, my friends, whatever. There's a healthy sense of pride. But then there's that disgusting look of pride, sort of like that disdain, sort of like, Ugh, okay, yeah, I better walk away. Do you see the difference? When it goes to the extreme of 
just look at me, you people, and just drool. That kind of a pride, that kind of a look. Just look at what I have or what I've done. Do you think you're better than the other guy? You have an air of superiority over the other people. You become the center of your own universe. This is also known as a disease called belly buttonitis. It's an ugly disease. The person's eyes are basically fixed on their belly button and they don't see what's going on around them. So everything they do, it's like, wow, look at me, look at me. You have that elevated sense of look at me and look at what I've done and look at what I've accomplished. I'm better than you. Really? You poor blind fool, you. I feel really, really bad for you. Now think again, by what power have you accomplished this? By yourself? Really? I want you to explain that one to me. Could you please prove it to me? Oh, and by the way, if you're going to give me a proof, it better be something that I can wrap my head around. Better make sure that it's something that I'm going to say, wow, that's really good. That's really wise what you're actually saying. And when you're going to be giving me your best proof, don't waste my time. Now before you do it, let me prove to you that you couldn't have done it by yourself. God needs to be part of the equation of whatever, who and what you are. Your breath is in God's hand. Turn with me now to Daniel chapter 5 and verse 23. But hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before thee, and thou and thy lords, thy wives and thy concubines, have drunk wine in them. And thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold, of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know. And the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, thou hast not glorified. The God in whose hand... Your breath is. And you did what by yourself? Don't forget where your breath is. Turn with me now to Job chapter 12 and verse 10. In whose hand is the soul of every living thing, the breath of all mankind? Your breath is in his hand. I'm just setting you up for the kill. It's coming up now. You have breath in your nostrils. Praise and thank God for that. It's by his mercy and grace that you're allowed your next breath. If you had stopped breathing 10 years ago, you wouldn't have accomplished what you've accomplished and now you're so boastful and you're so proud of yourself. Question, by what power do you breathe? I'm glad you asked the question. I want you to turn to Psalm 104.29. Your next breath does not belong to you. It's lent to you until it's going to be taken back. Thou hidest thy face, they are troubled. Thou takest away their breath, they die and they return to their dust. He takes your breath away, what happens, which is natural, you're going to drop dead, you're going to die. And what's going to happen, you're going to return to your dust. So again, by what power do you breathe? By God's power. Very good. I'm glad you're getting the lesson. He allows you to take the next breath that you're about to take. I want you to look at me. I want you to concentrate on your breathing right now. In. Out. Were you with me? In. Out. If he doesn't allow the next breath to come in, you're a goner. 911 is never going to make it. You understand? Your next breath is in his hand. Your next breath is lent by the Lord. Can I breathe? You can breathe now, yes. If God decides to close his hand on your next breath, you're going to be going through the different shades of blue, purple, pink, and yellow. When this happens, you're a goner. And there's nothing that you can do about it. There is nothing in your power for you to breathe your next breath. What does James have to say about this? I want you to turn to James chapter 4 verse 13. Go to now ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For those of you living in cold countries, in winter time, when you're breathing, there's hot air coming out and it's sort of like it freezes, it becomes white. All of a sudden it just vanishes, it just evaporates. That's what your life is. People don't realize that. You can drop dead at any second. That's why the Bible says in Corinthians, today is your day of salvation. Now that you have your thinking mind, now that you're breathing, now that you can actually say, Lord, I recognize my sin. Please forgive me, I repent. I believe that Jesus Christ died. I believe that you resurrect him from the dead and with my mouth, I'm gonna be confessing him. And with my mouth, I confess him. Today is the day for you to do that. You don't know what's gonna happen in five seconds from now, 10 seconds from now. 
The next verse we're going to be reading in verse 15, I want you to take this next advice. Humble are the people that can actually do this. For ye ought to say, this is what you should be saying. If the Lord will, if he's going to give me the opportunity to do it, we shall live and do this or that. For me in my life, whatever it is that I'm going through, that he gives me blessings. I thank God. Thank you, Lord, for what I'm going through right now. Try to be in the moment and say, thank you, Lord. Whatever it is, it could be the birth of a child. It can be whatever it is that's going to bring you love, peace, joy, happiness, whatever it is. You thank God for that. For you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live. We shall live because it's going to give you the next breath. We're going to do this or that, whatever it is, whatever it is that you decide to do. There's no pride in this statement. There's no I in this statement. There's no look at what I did in this statement. There's no look at what my hands have accomplished in this statement. If the Lord will, I will do this or that. And when He allows me to do something that it brings me great pleasure, I say, thank you, Lord. How many times do I thank God under my breath? This is the relationship that I have between me and my God. Nobody is ever going to separate me and the love that I have for God and the love that He has for me. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you ask God, how much do you love me? God's going to say, I loved you this much. No, I loved you this much. This much. He loved you so much that He died for you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That's what you need to understand. Once you start off at that starting block, you're running the 100 meter race, the gun goes off and you start running, this is the relationship that you're starting between you and your God. It's concentrated between you and your God. The Lord, He is everything that you do because He allows you to do whatever it is that you're doing. That's what you need to understand. So when your eye gets involved, God's going to darken it. Remember that one. People act as if they live forever. That's why I say, your next breath is not guaranteed you. And as I'm saying it to you, this is something that I need to remind myself. Did you know that? I'm going to plan this. It's like we're, I'm planning all kinds of stuff right now. And I'm all so freaking excited you can't imagine. Lord, this is what I would like to do. I'm planning my life, but He is involved in every aspect. Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge Him, and He's going to direct thy paths. Whatever I'm going through, acknowledge Him. Pride makes you look down on people, making you think that you're above all. God gives you the opportunity to get off your high horse. If not, He's going to aid you in getting off of that horse. He's going to aid you in falling off of that horse. That's going to be a pretty crushing spectacle for all to see. If you don't humble yourself, which is the best route for you to take, He will do it for you in a way that's going to be so embarrassing. How do I know? I've already been there. I want you to turn to Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. God even warns you in His Word. Pride goes before destruction. We're talking about the ugly pride here. A haughty spirit before a fall. The word haughty means proud, disdainful, having a high opinion of oneself with some contempt for others, lofty, arrogant, superlicious. That is ugly. Now recognize your pride and humble yourself before God. If you do this, God will not step in to correct it because you're taking the necessary steps. And God says, not a problem. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 31. For if we judge ourselves, we should not be judged. And in this case, it would be God. He would not be judging you. God gives you the opportunity to redeem yourself by seeing the error of your way. This comes from Abbott New Testament Commentary. We should judge ourselves, examine ourselves, and correct what is wrong or be judged, be condemned or be punished by God. It's either one or the other. You should judge yourself, examine yourself, correct what is wrong, or be judged, be condemned or be punished by God in this life and possibly in the one to come. As you notice, pride precedes destruction. He gives you the leeway to get off of that high horse. You're not getting off that high horse. He's going to knock you off. So pride precedes destruction and a haughty, arrogant spirit before the fall. So if you judge yourself, you will avert destruction and a fall and an embarrassment. You have the choice. It's basically before you. This judgment can be for any sin in your life. It doesn't have to be just for pride. The reason I'm hitting on pride, because we're going to be hitting Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4. Judge yourself that God doesn't have to do it for you. By judging yourself, you can do it by repenting of whatever it is, whatever sin, to God. Say, Lord, I've got this situation. I would like to get rid of this pride. 
If you're saved, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, He is going to help you. As a lost man, it's even harder. So again, I repeat, by judging yourself, you can do it by repenting to God in the privacy of your own home. If God does it, it's not going to be a pretty sight. Let me tell you that much. He does send you the signs warning you of your sin, whatever it is. In this case, we're speaking about pride. He's going to send you the signs through maybe your conscience, a gut feeling, your thoughts, things that you may see or hear around you. God will use anything and everything. It was something that was happening in my life. The Lord used two people. One of them was a complete stranger. He was a believer. And what he said, he basically told me what God was telling me for the past few months to stop. And I was acting stupid, like, I'm not understanding. And then he sent another friend of mine who's an atheist. He said a story that he hit me right about here. And believe me, he didn't miss. As soon as the last guy left, I said, Lord, I am really sorry. I repent. I knew, but I still was walking in that way. As a believer, yes, I do fall. If Paul says the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, those things I'm doing. To me, he's one of the greatest men. I cannot even shine his shoes for how low I am. But Paul says, you know what, Frank? I'm still at the same level like you are. So after they left, I said, Lord, I'm really sorry. As soon as that happened, in my brain, I just went click, click. I deleted the whole thing. I says, forgive me, Lord. And never again am I ever going to go there. That's what it means having a relationship between you and your God. God's going to guide you. God's going to be giving you signs. You can do this. By the way, signs, because this already happened to me in the past. He can give you signs for something good, whatever. Uh, and, uh, all of a sudden, you had your chance. Oh, man, oh, that was a good thing. Oh, no, it's gone. I have an uncle of mine. He told me this. He goes, when the train is passing, that's when you grab stuff out of the train. Because once the train has passed, you can't run after it, and there's nothing more you can grab. you got to grab it while it's in front of you. And God's going to be giving you the signs. Why aren't you seeing them? Why aren't you grabbing them? What is it that's stopping you? If you're a believer, please have this attitude in you. It's going to save you in embarrassment. It's going to save you in stupidities. It's going to save you in all kinds of stuff. That's what you need to understand. The signs are there. If you're honest and humble enough to heed to them. If you don't, it's the rebellious spirit within you going against God. He's giving you the sign. The Lord is gentle. He will never force you into anything because we have choice. He gave you the sign and you're saying no. God says not a problem. Maybe that might be the last time that that good thing might come to you. How do I know that? Because there's a lot of times in the past where God gave me something that I says no. Then I went back that I want. I said, sorry, buddy. Uh, the train came and went. You lost it. What do you want me to tell you? It's your flesh dictating what it wants and separates you from God. As a believer, if I start walking in the flesh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, you start walking in that way. You're still saved. What kind of a life are you going to lead? Your relationship between you and your God just got busted. There's a crink in the line. You're walking after the flesh. You're giving in to the gratification of whatever the flesh wants. Is it food? Is it sex? Is it drugs? Is it booze? Whatever it is. The lust of the eyes. I just want everything. If you're concentrating on your flesh, you cannot be concentrating on God. By you reading, the Holy Spirit is going to take those words, He's going to internalize them, He's going to mold it to you, and this is the way you should go. And when He does that, it's not because He wants you under control. He wants the best for you. He wants you to be happy. Whatever wrong or evil that you can do in life, God will send you the signs to turn back or to turn away from it. If you don't, you will eat the fruit of your own doings. God will warn you. I want you to turn to Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. You think you're going to take him for a ride? You're messing with the wrong guy. He's going to take you for a ride. And believe me, your two little shoes, they're going to pop up. They're just going to pop off your feet. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. If you plant tomato seeds, you ain't getting cucumbers. That's for sure. What are you planting that you're going to be getting back? This is a natural law that God has instituted in this universe. What you put out is what you're going to get. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Remember that principle, remember that law. What you're going to put out is basically what you're going to be getting in. Getting back to Nebuchadnezzar, he was warned in a dream about his pride, which Daniel interpreted for him. Did you ever hear the expression, in one ear, out the other? Well, this is a classic example. So I'd like to read the passage, and then I'm going to break it down for you. I want you to turn to Daniel chapter 4. We'll start reading in verse 1. 
Nebuchadnezzar the king unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. How great are his signs, and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, his dominion is from generation to generation. Before I go on, look at verse 3. How great are his signs, and how mighty are his wonders. Because he knew he was warned. God warns you in your life. Try to be sensitive to what's happening to the signs around you. Verse 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in mine house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore made I a decree to bring all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. Then came in the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers, and I told the dream before them, but they did not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. But at the last Daniel came in before me, whose name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, in whom the spirit of the holy gods, and before him I told a dream, saying, O Belshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee, and no secret troubleth thee, tell me the visions of my dream that I have seen, in the interpretation thereof. Thus were the visions of mine head in my bed. I saw, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof unto the end of all the earth. The leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all. The beasts of the field, and had shadow under it, the fowls of the heaven, dwelt in the bows thereof, and all flesh was fed of it. I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher, and holy one came down from heaven. He cried aloud, and said thus, Hew down the tree, cut off his branches, shake off his leaves, and scatter his fruit. Let the beasts get away from under it, and the fowls from his branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass, in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from man's and let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. This matter is by the decree of the watchers, and the demand by the word of the holy ones, to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will, and setteth up over it the basis of men. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen, and now, O Belteshazzar, declare the interpretation thereof, for as much as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation. But thou art able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. Notice how he keeps saying holy gods. That's going to be in the Trinity study, so relax. Verse 19. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished. The word astonished means astonished, amazed, he was stunned. For one hour, and his thoughts troubled him. The king spake and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate thee, and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. The tree that thou sawest, which grew and was strong, whose height reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair, and the fruit thereof, much in it was for meat for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and upon whose branches the fowls of the heaven had their habitation. It is thou, O king, thou art grown to become strong, for thy greatness is grown, and reacheth unto heaven thy dominion unto the end of the earth. And whereas the king saw a watcher and the holy one coming down from heaven, saying, Hew down the tree and destroy it, yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even a band of iron and brass, in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, let his portion be with the beasts of the field, till seven pass over him. This is the interpretation of what we just finished reading, okay? This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which is come upon my Lord the king, that they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Whereas they commanded to leave the stump of the tree roots, thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee. And after that thou shalt have known that the heavens do rule. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness and thine inequities, by showing mercy to the poor, if it be a lengthening of thy tranquility. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of twelve months, one year later, 
he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon, the king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. They shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men, and did eat grass as oxen, his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers, and his nails like bird's claws. At the end of the days, the seven times the seven years, so after seven years, at the end of the days I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, watch this, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to the will in the army of heaven, and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand, or say unto him, What doest thou? At the same time, my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth, and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. Guys, I'm going to stop it here next week. I'm going to give you some of the interpretations. There are certain verses, certain words I'm going to highlight. You're going to understand what Nebuchadnezzar ended up going through. God did abase Nebuchadnezzar's pride. He ended up eating grass like an ox. His hair ended up looking like eagle's feathers. Have you ever seen those homeless people? And you see their hair that they haven't washed? For seven years he hasn't washed. His nails, they look like claws. And his reason just left him. After he came back after seven years, he became greater. Nebuchadnezzar humbled himself and he became greater. By you humbling yourself, you will become greater than you coming out with your own pride. God's going to squash you. Okay? So we're going to continue next week. So guys, have yourselves a good week. Lord willing, we're going to see each other next week. Amen. So I have a question for you. Where will you spend eternity future? John 3.36 states, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. I want you to know that God provided the way for you to go to heaven. John 14.6 states, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now is the accepted time. Today is your day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2 states, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You may be asking yourself, how do I get salvation? Pray to God in your own words by believing what God said about obtaining salvation. Believe in your heart, not your head, what you are saying to God. The ABCs of salvation. A. Admit you have sinned against God and confess your sins to Him for forgiveness. Romans 3 verse 10 states, As it is written, there is is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23 states, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 1 John 1 verse 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. B. Believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and that God raised Jesus from the dead. Romans 5 verse 8 states, But God commandeth His love toward us, in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3 and 4 For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. C. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and call upon Him. Romans 10 verse 9 and 13 If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Remember, salvation is a free gift of God's grace. It is not of works. It is not a church membership. It is your relationship with God that created heaven and earth and everything in it. Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9 state, 
For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Receive Jesus Christ and believe on his name to be a child of God. John 1 verse 12 states, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Your choice, as Israel was given the choice between life and death, even so, I now put the same before you. Deuteronomy 30 verse 15 and 19. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. Remember, Romans 6 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Acts 16.31 Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved.